welcome to the third installment of celebrating 140 years of Rogers in objects. Today, we'll be taking a look at objects from 1953 to 1988. Let's get started. In 1956, Rogers celebrated the 75th anniversary of the town with an event called the Diamond Jubilee. It was a five-day event that went from August 29th to September 2nd. Each day had a different theme. There was Jubilee Parade Day, Pioneer Day, Youth Day, Good Neighbor Day, and Religious Dedication Day. Festivities of the Diamond Jubilee included crowning Joyce Wilson as Miss Jubilee, fireworks, Little League games between Rogers and Fayetteville, a fishing derby, the play Rogerama, which told the history of Benton County and Rogers, plus much more. The pin that you see here belonged to the group the Brothers of the Brush. Throughout the five-day celebration, men joined the Brothers of the Brush and would grow beards and mustaches like you see in this picture, while the women would join the Sisters of the Swish group and would wear old-fashioned bonnets and swishing skirts. The gown that you see here is made of synthetic taffeta plissé fabric with an ecru lace overlay on a long-sleeved bodice. It has a fitted bodice with a horseshoe neckline and a ruffle at the back of the neck. The year for the dress is unknown, but is likely dated to the 1950s or 1960s. In the 1950s, women's fashion leaned toward femininity and formality. In the 1960s, women's fashion followed three main trends, one of which continued the ladylike elegance seen in the 1950s. The dominant style for women in the 1950s was the nipped-in waist and full skirt and was seen in both day and evening wear. It was during this decade that sheaths and form-fitting dresses were becoming popular for formal evening wear. In the 1960s, full-skirted evening gowns were worn. These often had low necklines and close-fitting waists. This evening gown was owned by Vera Key, whom you see here. Miss Key was a remarkable lady who was born at War Eagle in 1893. A prominent Rogers family, the Blackburns, were the founders of War Eagle and were related to Vera on her mother's side. Among other achievements and endeavors, Vera helped create the Rogers Historical Museum in 1974, as well as served on its commission until 1978. She would prepare museum displays, collect artifacts for the growing collection, and would greet volunteers and visitors. The Rogers Historical Museum's Key Wing Building is named in honor of her and her dedication to the museum. In 1946, the Eversole Stave Mill was opened by E.C. Eversole and C.H. Bryant and was in business for 39 years. A stave is a narrow length of wood that has a slightly beveled edge. Staves are used to form the sides of tanks, tubs, vats, pipelines, and barrels like this one, which was what the staves from the Eversole Stave Mill mainly made. The maker of this barrel is unknown but it was made in the 1960s using staves from the Eversol mill and was a display piece in the mill's home office. The Eversol stave mill was just one of many in the state that provided both domestic and foreign distilleries with white oak staves for their whiskey barrels. The staves made at the Eversol mill here in Rogers were primarily sent to Lebanon, Kentucky, where Jim Beam used them to age their whiskey. Jim Beam was a longtime customer of the Eversol Stave Mill and preferred Arkansas White Oak for their barrels. Eversol and Bryant mainly used local wood for their staves produced at the mill because they liked to support local farms. At the time that the Eversol Stave Mill closed in 1985, it was the last operating stave mill in Arkansas. In 1974, a local man named Ralph Troseth invented this object the Troseth Space Transit. It is a combination sundial, starfinder, and astrology tool, and it was handmade and gifted to the Rogers Historical Museum by Mr. Troseth himself. People have been studying astrology, mapping the night sky, and using sundials to keep time for thousands of years. Sundials were first invented around 3500 BCE and are the earliest types of timekeeping devices. Sundials keep time by using the position of shadows cast by an object in the center of the sundial in relation to the sun's position in the sky. Star charts are used to map the night sky and are divided into grids to more easily identify and locate constellations. 
It's believed that the oldest star chart is the 32,500 year old chart on an ivory mammoth tusk that was carved by the early peoples moving from Asia into Europe. Astrology dates back even further and the earliest evidence we have of it being used dates back to the 3rd millennium BCE. This sundial by Ralph Troseth is only one of a handful that he made before he passed. To use it as a sundial, you focus the sunlight through one of two peepholes onto either the upper or lower plate on the left side of the device, depending on which month of the year it is. To use it as a star and constellation finder, you mount the device for true north and adjust the two rotary dials and a pointer to the reading for that date. Stars and planets will then appear in the viewing tube on the right. Today, we can access thousands of songs using MP3s and music apps, all with the touch of a button, and we can take that music with us anywhere and everywhere. There was a time, though, that music wasn't so portable, but an invention called the 8-track changed that. 8-tracks, also called the 8-track tape or the 8-track cartridge, were invented in 1964 by a consortium consisting of Ampex, Motorola, RCA Victor Records, Ford, and General Motors, and was led by Bill Lear of the Learjet Corporation. The 8-track was first introduced to the public in 1965 and became popular when Ford started to offer 8-track decks in their 1966 model of cars. The peak year of sales for the 8-track was 1978, but every year after that sales declined with them being phased out of stores in late 1982 and early 1983. This was due to them being replaced in popularity by the cassette tape. Eight tracks worked by dividing traditional two-sided LPs into four sections. The eight tracks main advantage was that it didn't have to be flipped over to play the other set of tracks. However, if the songs could not be divided evenly between the sections, then a song would be cut in half, ending in the middle of the song. The music would fade out until listeners heard a click, which indicated that the sections were changing. The 8-track you see here is the 1977 album Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. It was their 11th studio album and within the first month of its release, it sold over 10 million copies worldwide and now has sold over 40 million copies worldwide, making it one of the greatest and best-selling records of all time. Today, when you go to shave, you probably reach for a razor with a metal blade. Shaving instruments have been around for thousands of years though and many items have been used to shave with, such as shark's teeth, clamshells, and sharpened flint pieces by prehistoric people, solid gold and copper by Egyptians, and bronze and obsidian by Bronze Age cultures. By the 1700s, steel was being used to make razor blades, and in the 1880s in the United States, a safety razor in the shape of a hoe was produced. It had a steel blade with a guard along the edge to reduce the chance of cutting oneself while shaving. At the beginning of the 20th century, King Camp Gillette, founder of the shaving company today known as Gillette, combined a hoe-shaped razor with a double-edged replaceable blade. This razor blade here was collected either by Dr. Charles William Hoff or by Drs. Fay and John Bozeman during their trip to Russia where they observed a radial keratotomy surgery. In 1981, Dr. Hoff and the Bozemans merged their individual eye clinics into becoming one, the Bozeman Hoff Clinic, which still exists today. Charles Hoff still practices ophthalmology here in Rogers, but the Bozemans have shifted their focus. Faye Bozeman had been in the National Guard, an Arkansas State Senator, and a director of the Arkansas Health Department before he passed away in 2005. John Bozeman was in the U.S. House of Representatives and since 2010 has been a member of the United States Senate. Thank you for joining us today for part three of celebrating 140 years of Rogers in Objects. Make sure to join us for the fourth and final installment in this series when we look at the years 1989 to 2021. See you at the museum. Bye! Bye.